before I, I guess I'll just start. If anyone can tell me if I'm live or not right now. Um, hold on one sec. I don't see the Twitch stream live. Sarah, are you there? Mm. All right. On Twitch? Yeah. All right, so I can start? Okay. There you go. All right. Thanks, uh, everyone. And hi, everyone. Um, I hope everyone can hear me and see the presentation. Um, first off, I'd like to thank the organization for offering me the opportunity to present here, uh, as well as everyone who is here um, to attend. My presentation is called Contextualizing or Decontextualizing License of Hermione, uh, and will, as the title says, present a cyber epigraphy of uh, Latin and Greek inscriptions in recent Ubisoft games. Since um, Andrew Reinhardt's Archeo Gaming, and already before that, um, video game environments have begun to be considered as archaeological sites uh, in their own right and to be examined using archaeological methods. Um, Reinhardt showed how disciplines like archaeology could prove fruitful in the analysis of virtual worlds. Um, this presentation furthers this line of thought using not archaeological but epigraphical methods um, to analyze video game objects with ancient Greek or Latin inscriptions. And perhaps first, a brief introduction as to what epigraphy is uh, and studies. Um, briefly put, epigraphy is a science of inscriptions. And an inscription is any kind of text or document that literally is inscribed into any kind of object, like stone, for example, but also lead, bronze, gold, wood, clay, uh, bone, what have you. Um, inscriptions are non-literary texts. They aren't the work of great authors with pro products of uh, more or less everyday people. Um, or they're short texts that were produced by order of more important people, but don't share the same literary ambition as a, a great works of art do. Um, inscriptions, they are first-hand sources of the ancient world and are therefore vital to our understanding of antiquity. Um, while students of ancient literature um, are always forced to use later rewritings of the text they study, rewritings which may vary from an original text, um, the science of epigraphy is privileged with access to uh, the original source as it was known in antiquity itself. The content of ancient inscriptions can be very varied. They can, for example, be official documents uh, of law presented to to the people in a public place. Um, they could also be more private texts, such as uh, tombstones or graffiti, uh, or they could also be religious in nature. And the text that we'll discuss today will also show this uh, variety of content. A question we can also ask is, um, can epigraphy as a discipline be fruitful for the study of games in similar ways as archaeology have been proven to be over the past few years? And I think so, yes. Um, one could, of course, look at the overt ways uh, that epigraphy is present in games, as is the case with a game like Heaven's Vault, for example, uh, where epigraphy and the learning of an alien language is a key mechanic. Um, through finding alien inscriptions and learning how this script works, you'll be able to decipher alien texts, which will allow you to learn about the world and even to uh, compose the historical timeline of that world. But an epigraphical analysis of game environments could, for example, also mean the study of player-created texts or text objects in video games, like, for example, um, player science in Minecraft. Um, one could, for instance, survey virtual worlds and look at what kinds of texts uh, players write, how these texts uh, function, where they are placed, and what kind of language they are written, uh, and so on. And I think that maybe we can expect the same kind of variety as actual inscriptions also have. I think that might be interesting, but in this presentation, I will focus not on the player, but on the developer side of the game medium uh, and look at actual historical inscriptions included in video games. Like I said, I will focus on ancient Latin and Greek inscriptions in um, recent Ubisoft games. Specifically, I will talk about the games Assassin's Creed Origins, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and Immortals Phoenix Rising, all games that engage with the ancient world either explicitly or more implicitly in one case. It was a very conscious choice on my part to focus on Ubisoft games, as Ubisoft is a game studio that over the years, and primarily through its Assassin's Creed series, has garnered the reputation of a developer with a genuine interest in portraying historically accurate, or perhaps better, historically authentic or plausible uh, recreations of historical periods and locations. Um, it's, interesting, it's interesting to see how a developer like this goes about recreating the past with an eye on historical authenticity, but also, of course, constrained by the resources at its disposal. 
Before looking at the inscriptions that these games present, I think it would be best to briefly outline each of these games and to frame them in their historical or, in one case, uh, mythological setting to get an idea of the context in which the inscriptions are presented, as well as to introduce the games for anyone unfamiliar with them. That's Repeat Origins is the oldest of the games I'll be looking at, uh, released in 2017 by Ubisoft Montreal. Um, Origins takes you to the final days of Ptolemaic Egypt, uh, set from 48 to 44 BCE, and immerses you in various historical events, such as the Siege of Alexandria or the assassination of Julius Caesar. Um, as the Egyptian character Bayek, you will vi visit the Egyptian desert and oases, um, the Nile, and multiple meticulously detailed cities like Alexandria, Memphis, uh, Cyrene, or Karanis, uh, in a journey which eventually leads to the foundation of the Brotherhood of Assassins, after which a series is, names, is named. Um, Origins includes recreations of many historical sites and even includes background dialogue uh, by non-playable -play characters in ancient Greek, Latin, and a reconstructed version of ancient Egyptian. One year later, um, Ubisoft uh, released Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which reuses many of the assets produced for Origins. Um, this time around, the franchise travels to ancient Greece, uh, and specifically the first nine years of the Peloponnesian War. Um, for the first time in an Assassin's Creed title, uh, the player chooses whether to play as a male or a female character, named either Cassandra or Alexios, depending on your choice, um, although Cassandra is the canonical protagonist in the franchise. The game is huge, um, offering almost the entirety of Greece to be discovered. And the game is huge, um, offering almost the entirety of Greece to be discovered. And difficulties uh hang on everybody T just some technical difficulties because it's the first presentation of the con okay. there you are just working i i don't know what happened i think my mouse wigged out wait what happened uh, he should be up and running again. He just needs to enable the stream and start going. Yay! Are we, are we good now? Or yeah, you should be good. Just go ahead. I'm so sorry. Just go no, ahead and good. restart, and we'll just blame the internet gods. So where did we lose it? Where did we lose it? Um. Good point. This would happen at an in-person con too. <laughs> Yeah. Um, maybe I could just introduce Valhalla again. Maybe I think I think that's where so you were at. This, put the stream up. You are just at the end of Origins. Oh, Origins. Okay. Hang on, I All gotta right. find I'm gonna this have to screen again. Enable your stream one more time. Screen share again. Oh, wait, so I got to do the screen share again. What did you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just go ahead and uh, send oh, your, okay. your screen live again because you're, yeah. you're not sharing any video right now. Okay. Um, Sorry about that. No, no problem. Uh, there we go. Should be back? Stream. Yes. Not to let my computer catch up. Yeah, I see you on Odyssey there. There you are. Hey. So I take it back to the last slide of um, Origins real quick, and then just finish okay. up your last point on that, and then continue. All right. Yeah, it's looking good on the Twitch, so I think you're good. Hello. We're back. All right. Okay, no problem. So, um, as I was saying, um, in Origins, many ancient cities uh, um, eventually... Uh, you f found the Brotherhood of Assassins, after which a, ser a series is named. And it also includes recreations of many historical sites and even includes background dialogue by uh, non playable characters in ancient Greek, uh, Latin, and a reconstructed version of ancient Egyptian as well. Then, one year after Origins, um, Ubisoft released Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which uh, reuses many of the assets produced for Origins. 
Um, this time around, the franchise travels to ancient Greece and specifically the first nine years of the Peloponnesian War. Um, for the first time in an Assassin's Creed title, uh, the player chooses whether to play as a male or female character, uh, named either Cassandra or Alexios, depending on your choice. Although um, Cassandra is the canonical protagonist in the franchise. Um, the game is huge, uh, offering almost the entirety of Greece to be discovered and played in, uh, and again, recreating various historical locations like Athens, uh, Sparta, or Delphi, as well as historical events like the Athenian Plague, uh, the Battle of Pylos, and the Battle of Amphipolis. Um, 2020's Assassin's Creed Valhalla is at first sight perhaps an odd selection here, as it isn't set in classical antiquity, uh, but in 9th century England. Um, the game tells the story of Eivor, uh, a Norse Viking, again either male or female, uh, and their company, the Raven Clan, which uh, travels to England uh, to settle and expand their empire. Um, in this medieval world, however, um, Roman antiquity is omnipresent. Uh, once you uh, reach England after a relatively uh, short prologue in Norway, um, Sigurd, the Jarl of your clan, who's traveled all across Europe, mentions that the Romans were the giants that built this land, a uh, giant of a forgotten age whose ruins still dot the landscape, thereby referring to the Roman conquest of Britain in the first century uh, CE and its status as um, a Roman province after that. Um, soon after your arrival, a Roman named Octavius will travel to your settlement to set up a uh, museum and ask you to collect dozens of Roman antiquities. Um, there's ruins of aqueducts, uh, arches, uh, temples, uh, basilicae, uh, settlements, uh, amphitheaters, there's uh, Adrian's Wall, and of most interest, of course, for this paper, there's uh, Latin inscriptions. Spring from these historical settings is our fourth and uh, final game, Immortals Phoenix Rising, a mythologically uh, inspired Ubisoft game released only a month after Valhalla, where the player takes up the role of Phoenix, once more a character that can be played both male or female. Um, the setting is the Golden Isle, uh, a fantastical island reportedly created by Daedalus uh, for the gods to inhabit. And the island has dedicated regions to Hermes, uh, Aphrodite, Athena, Hephaestus, Ares, and Zeus, each of which has its own distinct architecture and design style. Made by the same studio that, that uh, created Odyssey, the game reuses many of the assets and textures that were designed for that game, and as we will see, some inscriptions as well. All of these games are uh, open-world, third-person action-adventure games, meaning that they give you full control of an established character in a world that is yours to travel and explore, while also offering you a narrative um, that is quest-like in nature. Um, Writing on games with historical settings, uh, historian Adam Chapman uses the term realist simulation style to point to the way in which games like these um, recreate or simulate history. Um, they immerse their players in a simulation of history that claims to be how it was, uh, with a tendency for high-end graphics, a narrative where you usually play the protagonist, and a general style of reconstructing historical events as if the player was one of the people that actually lived it. Um, and it is as a part of this project of realism that we find ancient inscriptions in which we will, uh, to which we will now um, turn. The remainder of this presentation is uh, divided into three large parts, um, fully aware that these partially overlap. Um, first, we'll discuss the content and context in which inscriptions appear. Secondly, we ponder the question of why these inscriptions are included. I mean, what is their purpose? Uh, and finally, we will look at their formal and linguistic characteristics. I mean, what do they look like, especially when compared to their ancient uh, equivalents? And let's start with the inscription that inspired the name of this presentation. When you visit the sanctuary of Asclepius uh, in Assassin's Creed Odyssey's version of Epidauros, you'll stumble upon this little inscription that reads as follows. Uh, in Greek, it says, um, Luson Hermionos Paisaides, Hutos uh, Hypar, Hypokinoston, Katatohiaron, Therapeomenos, Tus Optilus Yugies Apelte. And translated, this means Luson of Hermione, which, was a, which is a city in the Peloponnese uh, area of Greece, uh, was a blind child. In a waking state, he was healed by one of the dogs of the sanctuary and he walked away with healthy eyes. It is a so called Epidaurian uh, miracle inscription which uh, tell the stories of uh, miraculous healings that took place in the sanctuary of Asclepius, the uh, Greek god of medicine. The text is part of a much larger inscription that itself is only one part of several steles uh, or uh, erected stones uh, with such inscriptions on them. The or original um, Lyston inscription dates to the 4th century BCE, uh, which is later than the setting of the game, which takes place in the 5th century BCE. So technically, we could criticize the game uh, for including an inscription which didn't exist at the time when the game is set. 
But even though the inscription is anachronistic here, it's still fitting that the inscription is included in its original context, the sanctuary of Epidauros. We can say that the inscription is contextualized. We encounter it in its context, which wouldn't be the case if we just read the Greek text on a piece of paper. Um, the game is kind of like a virtual museum in that respect, uh, where you find and potentially learn about ancient sources in the recreated version of the environment where you have found them in antiquity. However, if you start to walk around the sanctuary, you'll start to notice something weird. The same inscription isn't included just once, but pops up time and time again as you approach different stones. Here, for example, we see three stones right next to each other with the Lyceum inscription, although in antiquity there was only one text. Uh, and this doesn't just happen in Epidauros. If you go to other cities like Athens or Delphi, you'll find the same text. Even more, the inscription also pops up um, on the messenger board of your boat um, or on various uh, Hermes messenger boards uh, throughout the world underneath the statue of uh, the god Hermes. And it doesn't even stop there. Start playing an entirely different game altogether and the inscription will still be there. In the Hall of the Gods, the Immortals Phoenix Rising, sort of like the hub for the world where, where you'll upgrade your armor, weapons and skills, you will see the Lyceum inscription again, not just once or twice, but thrice on the same stone. So seeing as this inscription is also present in other locations and indeed all over the world of Odyssey and even in a different game, um, we can say that the inscription loses its contextualization once it starts to be copied and to be removed uh, from the, its original setting of Epidauros. Um, the inscription is then decontextualized. The concept of uh, decontextualization is known to the study of what's called classical reception or the way in which classical antiquity lives on or is received in subsequent time periods. Um, in his book, The Future of the Classical, Salvatore Settis talks about classical architecture in the postmodern age, saying that it, and I quote, um, exalts intrinsically fragmentary and incoherent classical references and divides the ancient up into minimal decontextualized units that can be recycled arbitrarily. And this same process is at work here in games. Um, the inscription turns into a minimal uh, decontextualized unit that the developers can use to fill their world with. Um, Sedis's phrase, um, recycled arbitrarily, uh, seemed especially apt, as this is literally what has happened here. Um, the developers created the textures for, these, uh, for one video game object uh, that they then reused or recycled and placed across the entire map. Um, decontextualization isn't uh, exclusive to Odyssey. It was already pres present in Origins, where you find the same text underneath different statues. It's also present in Valhalla, where you find the same inscription, for example, in your settlement of uh, Ravensthorpe, uh, but also in different locations like East Anglia or London. Um, in Immortals, you'll find the same stones as well when you're asked to travel to different steelies in the region dedicated to Athena. And again, theoretically, we could criticize the games and their developers for this, saying that this diminishes their uh, historical realism and that they have included mistakes um, in their games. But I personally don't think this critique is very useful. Um, it's unreasonable to ask them to uh, include hundreds of inscriptions that, as I'll talk about later, uh, might not even be noticed by the player. Um, game developers are always constrained by budget, deadlines, workforce, uh, and choices, of course, need to be made. I mean, if you want the game to be as detailed as, uh, if you want the game world to be as detailed as the actual world, the game world will take as long to create as the actual world, and additionally, it will be equally as large, which is not something that current game systems are prepared for. But with these um, simultaneously operating techniques of contextualization and decontextualization in mind, let's now look at uh, the array of Latin and Greek inscriptions that we can find in these four games. For example, when you travel to Cyrene in Origins, you run into plaques like these that are situated underneath uh, larger statues, um, like this one which is placed underneath the statue of Apollo, an uh, actual statue, by the way, from the Hellenistic period, uh, actually found in Cyrene and currently on display in the British Museum. Um, the inscription here is a cutout from a larger actual inscription, and this cutout doesn't mean anything in and of itself. Um, the larger inscription is part of a decree that was made around 430 BCE in uh, the Greek city of Eleusis, a text that, based on its, on its content, has nothing to do with the context in which it is presented here. There is no connection between this classical Eleusinian decree and Hellenistic or Ptolemaic Egypt. Um, so this is another example of decontextualization. And again, like I already showed, um, this inscription is copied all over the city uh, of Cyrene. 
Um, you can also find this larger inscription, like the the, the, the decree from Eleusis, uh, in, in, in a non-cut-out form. Um, but as we see, uh, while the actual inscription is uh, broken near the bottom, the inscription in the game uh, fills that space up with Greek words. And the words it uses to fill that space come from a little, a little bit higher up uh, in the inscription uh, and roughly correspond to the um, cutout uh, blocks uh, and the text that is displayed on them. So the game sort of reconstructs the inscription to its pre-broken state, which is something that we often find in video games with uh, ancient settings. Um, staying in Cyrene, at one point in the game, your character Bayek will find this Greek uh, graffito at the city's large gladiator arena. Um, the inscription is not ancient, uh, but it's a uh, modern attempt by Ubisoft to create their own Greek inscription and integrate it into the game. And the inscription comes with its own in-game translation, but as has been rightfully pointed out by uh, Peter Gainsford on his blog, The Kiwi Hellenist, um, this translation and the graffito don't say the same thing. Um, instead of reward, the gladiator champion Polymester has escaped, talked to the uh, Lanista at the gladiator school. The inscription actually says in uh, Gainsford's translation, Pay the foremost of the man-mounters your Polymester has done off, have intercourse of the leisure of man-mounters. And this is nonsensical. Um, Gainsford also shows what went wrong. Um, the last word on the second line, um, Apodedrake, is missing a syllable, which turns it into a completely different verb. Um, the author has confused the last word of the inscription, the Greek word uh, skole, with the Latin word skola, uh, so it doesn't mean school but leisure. Um, the Latin word lanista, uh, the trainer of gladiators, uh, which is included in the translation, is nowhere to be found in the Greek text. Uh, but strangest of all is the fact that they've used this word, uh, androbates, uh, as gladiator, whereas this rare word only pops up in four ancient sources and it means exactly what Gainsford uh, translates it with uh, a man mounter because of this the first word on the last line omile sate stops um uh, would in this case lose its meaning of converse with or talk to but in this context it gains a sexual meaning that is reflected in Gainsford translation to have intercourse so this text actually ends up being a poor attempt by ubisoft um to make their own greek inscription and by the way, uh, Gainsford also comments on the use of the exclamation mark at the beginning of the text, which was in fact a medieval invention. In the game's version of Alexandria, uh, we also find this inscription in a bathhouse. I wasn't able to get a very good picture of it when I first played the game, and now I can't return to this place without replaying the entire game. Um, so I took an image from this YouTube video where you can see the text. Um, this text, which we'll read uh, later, uh, also isn't ancient as a modern invention of the developers, although it's definitely better than the previous one, but it still has its own fair share of problems. Um, finally, there is one inscription which I'm sure no one here who knows Greek uh, will like. Um, I found instances of these around the city of Cyrene in the region of Cyrenaica, uh, where the Roman and Latin influences are felt the most throughout the game. Um, there's a lot of Roman architecture and so soldiers that shout at you in uh, bad Latin. Uh, well, this inscription is technically uh, a Latin inscription, but for some reason it does this weird thing where it writes some of the uh, letters in the Latin alphabet and others in the Greek alphabet. But the letters that are in Greek aren't actually supposed to be the Greek letters that are written, but just Greek letters that look like the Latin letters in those words. So while the text says this in a mix of Greek and Latin uh, letters, it actually wants to say this in uh, Latin. Senatus populus per Romanus omnes silfium possident latrones supplicium subituri sunt. But for some reason, the developers looked for Greek letters, which would look like some of the Latin letters, and they then used those to create this object, which is odd. The game offers a translation of uh, the text as well. Uh, the people of Rome on the Silphium, thieves will be executed, which is not a bad translation. Um, it omits the words uh, senatus for senate. It should be the senate and people of Rome. Um, and omne for all the Silphium. Um, but all things considered, this translation is decent. Unfortunately, because of the mix of alphabets, this is what the text actually ends up saying, which again is nonsensical. And this is a phenomenon that happens quite frequently in popular culture. Um, for example, in the logo of uh, Netflix's Beyonce film Homecoming, which literally says this, 
Um, or most recently, um, new limited edition shoes by Nike, a brand named after a Greek goddess that wanted to celebrate its Greek inspiration um, by selling shoes with Greek letters on them. And they wanted those letters to resemble the word Nike in Greek. But it actually ends up saying Pix if you read what it says. Um, it's strange that a developer like Ubisoft would actually do this, um, especially when compared to the effort that they've put into the other inscriptions and the other details um, that they put in their worlds. Moving on to Odyssey, uh, we've already talked about the license inscription and how it is actually part of a uh, much larger inscription. And the entire inscription, which you can see here, uh, is uh, 126 lines long. And the part about license comprises the last uh, two lines. Um, the game also uses another part of this uh, inscription, um, a little bit higher up uh, from the license text. And this text is about a man whose toe is miraculously healed by a snake uh, from the sanctuary. Um, in translation, um, the text reads, A man's toe was healed by a snake while suffering terribly in his toe because of the raging pain. He was taken outside um, by the service during the day and he sat on a seat. Um, when sleep took hold of him, a snake crawled towards him from the abaton, and the abaton was the place where the patients uh, slept, and healed the toe with its tongue. Afterwards, he went uh, back to the abaton. When the man woke up again, healed, uh, the man said he saw a vision or had seen a vision, um, having thought that a youth with a comely appearance had put a drug on his toe. However, if we compare the Greek text to what it actually says in-game, um, we see again something strange has happened. The text on the game's tome does not make sense. It just contains some random words, not even uh, complete words sometimes. Um, but all of those words were taken from the inscription of the man and the snake. The words were seemingly selected at random. Um, there's no structure. Words from the beginning of the original text show up at the end of the inscription and so on. It's really odd and actually quite a step down from what they did with the license inscription. Um, basically, this text func functions as a uh, Greek version of the Latin lorem ipsum, uh, a nonsensical placeholder text used in uh, graphic design to show what a, a document might look like when the text hasn't been uh, written yet. They also do this uh, on other uh, occasions with the same uh, inscription. Throughout the world of Odyssey, you'll find uh, these exedrai or half-circle benches uh, inscribed with several Greek words. There are seven in total, and they were also taken from the same inscription as you can see here. Um, uh, what is really strange, however, is the second word, uh, eselton, meaning entering or he who enters. Um, what's weird is that this word isn't written in the inscription, nor in any of the other miracles related in the 126 lined uh, text. So where does this come from? My best guess is that they've mixed it up with another word from the inscription. Um, here in purple we have the Greek word exelton, which means exiting, or he who exits. Um, uh, and which, say for one letter, the second one is identical to the word uh, on the exedra. The second letter in exalton is the Greek letter xi, um, whereas the inscription has the Greek letter sigma. And what could then be uh, the reason for the changing of the second letter? It's not that they don't have the uh, texture for the Greek letter xi, because it pops up in other inscriptions in Odyssey. Is it a typo? Maybe. Perhaps that's the most likely solution. But in the type, it would have to have been made by someone who knew Greek because the two words are so alike. If anyone in the audience here today has another explanation, please let me know uh, in the chat. Um, the same text is also used in other places in the game where you'd expect an actual historical inscription. If you go to the city of uh, Gortin uh, on Crete, you'll find the famous Gortin Code, an uh, important ancient law document detailing uh, various topics such as divorce, uh, property rights, rape, and so on. Um, in real life, the Gortin Code looks like this, but in the game it once again is a bunch of randomly selected words from the inscription of the man and the snake, as well as the license inscription. Um, again, we could criticize the game for not including the actual Gordon code, and while this certainly is uh, a pity, uh, we should acknowledge the difficulties and the immense amount of work that would entail for something to be used only once in the game and that some players might not even notice. Um, the inscription of the Mad and the Snake is also used for many in-game papyrus scrolls, which doesn't really work because in classical antiquity, the letters in papyrus scrolls look different from the letters inscribed in stones, and the difference is kind of comparable to the um, difference between your own handwriting and the letters that you type in your computer. Um, the developers wanted these papyrus scrolls to look Greek and they wanted them to say something or at least give the impression of uh, saying something. 
but by copying the same text again, they inadvertently made the mistake of using the wrong letters um, from the scroll. And as you can see, it uh, mixes the words together. Uh, uh, it kind of mixes the words uh, again. It doesn't just follow the Greek text. Um, uh, the uh, one last instance where the same text pops up is in another game, Immortals Phoenix Rising, made by the same studio that did Odyssey. In the region that you visit, in the first region that, that you visit, um, the Clashing Rocks, the dedic that, that dedicated to Hermes, um, you find this stone, which again reuses some of the words uh, from the inscription. Um, one final inscription in Odyssey can be found in the game's version of Olympia, uh, the city renowned for the Olympic Games. Um, on the Temple of Zeus, you'll find the names of 10 Olympic sports which have been inscribed into the temple. Um, as far as I know, this is also an invention by Ubisoft, and these sports didn't actually appear on the uh, ancient Greek temple. Moving on then to Valhalla, uh, we see that the game includes multiple Latin inscriptions, all of which are again historical inscriptions actually found in Britain and thus testaments of the Roman province that Britain uh, once was. There's two uh, funerary inscriptions, for instance, this one. Um, this is inscription 21 in the uh, Roman Inscriptions of Britain collection, a funerary inscription um, for a 19-year-old woman named Claudia Martina, set up by her husband, dating from the uh, late 1st century CE and found in London in 1806. On the right, you see an image of what the actual uh, historical inscription looks like. Um, for example, this one says, To the spirits of the departed and to Claudia Martina, age 19, and then Cletus, a slave of the province, set this up to his most devoted wife. She lies here. Um, the other funerary inscription is RIB 9, um, one for a 70-year-old Athenian who went by the name of Aulus Alphidius Olusa. Um, this was also found in London in 1852 and says, uh, Aulus Alphidius Olusa of the Pomsine voting tribe, age 70, born in a at Athens, lies here. In accordance with his will, uh, his heir set this up. Um, there's also a dedication to the emperors uh, Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus, which must mean that this inscription dates from the period between 161 and 169 CE, uh, when Lucius Verus ruled together with Aurelius. Um, this dedication was set up by uh, a man called Caecilius Lucanus, uh, a, a prefect of a Roman cohort and found in Ilkley in or before 1603. And this one says, for the welfare of the Emperor Caesars, our august ones, Antoninus and Verus, beloved by Jupiter, uh, Caecilius Lucanus, prefect of the cohort, set this up. Uh, and Antoninus is a uh, different name for Marcus Aurelius here. Um, this one is an altar uh, set up by a man named Gaius Julius Crescens to the Matres Domesticae, or goddesses of the household, uh, found in New York in 1880. Uh, it says, Gaius Julius Crescens, to the mother goddesses of the household, deservedly and um, willingly fulfilled his vow. Finally, there's this interesting inscription, because it combines uh, two historical inscriptions, um, RIB 2317 and RIB 643. Um, the upper lines, the two upper lines of the inscription um, come from a, a boundary stone of a burial area of an unknown place and date, but found sometime before 1894. Um, the rest of the text is a dedication to Holy Britannia uh, by a man called Nicomedes, um, found in York in 1740, and says, To Holy Britannia, Nicomedes, freedmen of our emperor, set this up. But again, while these inscriptions were found in places like London or York, the game copies the, uh, these objects and places them all across the map. Um, you can find these inscriptions in the museum of your settlement, uh, but also in other places like I've already shown, like uh, East Anglia or London. Uh, and often with multiple copies in the same place. So again, the developers have definitely tried to preserve that authenticity by including remnants of Roman Britain in their version of Britain, uh, but they have copied them in order to fill the rest of the world with these inscriptions as well. We've already shown the reoccurrence of the Epidauros inscriptions in Immortals Phoenix Rising. The game also includes uh, these inscriptions in, in the region that is dedicated to Athena. Um, the storyline of this region is all about learning to become a hero, which is a large part of the game. Um, Athena asks that you search for four steles, uh, each dedicated to a different Greek hero. There's one to uh, Atalanta, Achilles, Odysseus, and Heracles. And the steles all look like this. They're all identical to each other. Um, however, this text uh, stands out from the other inscription that I'll mention here, uh, because this text is actually not an inscription at all. Um, this text is a literary text um, and contains the first four lines of a Homeric hymn dedicated to Athena. 
a religious poem reportedly uh, written by the ancient Greek poet Homer. Um, the stone here does not include the fifth and final line. Um, in a more or less literal translation, the hymn reads as follows. Um, I start to sing of Pallas Athena, uh, the protector of the city, the dread one who, with Ares, uh, deals with deeds of war and sacked cities and battle cries and fighting and protects um, and who protects the men coming to and from the wars. Um, greetings, uh, goddess, give us fortune and happiness. It's fitting, of course, that this hymn should be included in the region dedicated to Athena. At one point during Eris' storyline, the god of war who has been transformed into a chicken uh, will ask you to retrieve his psalm pings or uh, a war trumpet, as well as the melody of a song that will open the gates to Eris' fortress. Um, the melody, which was uh, composed by the mythological character Pan, um, is located in one of the game's so-called Vault of Thunderous uh, environments in the underworld where Phoenix must solve large puzzles. You eventually find two rocks on which the melody is written, and you're supposed to combine them into this cylinder-like uh, stone that you can see here. Um, it's hard to get a good picture of it because of its shape, um, so I've transcribed the inscription on it with the crack in the middle. In translation, it says, I am an image, a stone. Um, Psyche Loss placed me here as a long-lasting sign of immortal memory. Um, the inscription makes it look as if the stone is speaking for itself and as if it is acknowledging its creator. Um, the text is part of the so-called Psychilos Epitaph, uh, a cylinder-like stone found in Tralles in modern-day Turkey, uh, probably stemming from the 1st or 2nd century CE, although its date is contested. Um, the epitaph is renowned for being the oldest complete musical notation found anywhere in the world. Um, the text on the actual Psychilos Epitaph uh, looks like this. Um, the first part of the inscription is what is shown uh, in Immortals. Um, this is not the musical composition uh, or notation itself. This is the introduction or indication um, at the top of the stone. The actual song and its musical notation um, follow after this. And at the end uh, of the stone, the name of Cyclos is repeated. This inscription works similarly to the Homeric hymn that we saw earlier. When the developers needed a text for the Ath uh, Athena region, they used an ancient text that is dedicated to her. When they need a Greek text for a musical composition, they use a part of a text that is associated with a Greek um, musical composition. Again, we see that the developers look for a text that has some association with the context uh, where it is supposed to be, um, even though the exact content of the inscription is not explicitly alluded to. It's also worth noting that the Cyclops epitaph is never uh, reused or copied. There's only one version of it in the game, and this is it. In respect to the context of these inscriptions, it also needs to be said that in many cases, um, the player does not need to pay attention to these objects. Um, these inscriptions uh, are game objects that perhaps oftentimes fade into the background uh, or whose existence or importance uh, can be uh, refused by the player uh, in the process of gameplay. Um, I use the term refuse in the same sense that it is used by the uh, early and influential game scholar Jesper Yule uh, when he talks about uh, players' possible refusal of narrative in video games. And just like players do not necessarily have to pay attention to a game's narrative by, for example, skipping cutscenes and only playing the game for the raw gameplay, um, players don't have, have to check out each of these inscriptions. It's perhaps also telling that even while playing on a high-definition television, um, some of these inscriptions remain relatively uh, low resolution, especially in Valhalla. Nonetheless, I think these objects are productive in the process of the game's production of meaning uh, and the creation of, in this case, a historically authentic atmosphere. There's only a few instances where the inscriptions are implemented or contextualized into the game's uh, story. The best example is a graffito from Origins. Um, finding it gives you the uh, gladiator theme side quest called Are You Not Entertained? Um, so the inscription and the admonition to go find the Lanisa at the gladiator school is the beginning of a narrative thread that the player is supposed to follow. In many other uh, cases, the, games, uh, the, the game might lead you to a certain inscription, but for reasons wholly different uh, from the inscription itself. For instance, one side quest in Origins uh, asks that you enter the tomb of Batos, um, the founder of, this, of the city of Cyrene. In the tomb, we're supposed to investigate why the Roman occupiers have closed the tomb. The game wants you to read several texts uh, about Batos and Cyrene, um, and leads you to several stones that supposedly have those texts on Batos on them. For example, here, um, the game 
uh, offers a text on Batos and his bow, although the text that is actually included on the stone uh, that Bayek is supposed to be reading is the Eleusis inscription from before that we find all over the place. The same goes for the steelies in Immortals Phoenix Rising. When you go to the stele of Heracles, the last of the four steelies you encounter, your task or quest is to remember the 12 labors of uh, Heracles. Phoenix apparently reads them from the steely, um, as indicated by the inner dialogue presented here uh, as subtitles. Although, as we've said, the text on the steely is actually a Homeric hymn to Athena. So in these cases, the inscription becomes uh, a stand-in for the generic concept of text. And while the stone is technically a part of the game storytelling because you interact with it in order to progress through the narrative, um, the inscription itself is purely ornamental. Associated with this question of uh, narrative integration is the question of what the purpose might then be of these inscriptions. Uh, seeing as we can plausibly assume that most of the players of these games are not first in Latin or Greek, uh, and therefore won't understand the exact meaning of these objects, and multiple answers arise. First, the inscriptions are productive in the process of world building. Um, they lend a level of vivacity to the world. Um, it shows the world as a transient environment with its own, with its own history and where people are supposed to live, uh, or at least we're supposed to believe that they do. Uh, we as players are supposed to get immersed in the world that we're, we play in, to um, willingly suspend our disbelief, or as it's also been said in early game research, uh, to actively create our belief uh, in the world. Um, small elements like these inscriptions help us to believe in the worlds that we visit and pr uh, prompt us to further want to explore these worlds and their history. Secondly, these inscriptions perhaps also um, serve to legitimize the game world as an ancient world. The inscriptions and the alphabets that are on them serve to remind us of the historical referentiality of these worlds. Um, they provide an ancient contextualization and a ground for why the game should be perceived and experienced as ancient Egypt, Greece, and so on. Um, they're one of the elements that we automatically associate with, with antiquity and therefore make us recognize the world we are playing in as an ancient world. There's also an educational aspect uh, to these inscriptions. It has been continuously shown that Ubisoft's uh, uh, Assassin's Creed games have enormous educational and didactic potential, um, from the painstaking recreations of uh, historical periods, the uh, meeting with historical characters, to the um, appraised discovery tours. Um, the Assassin's Creed games have many possible uses in pedagogic contexts, and the included inscriptions also have this educational function, introducing perhaps lesser widely known aspects of antiquity to uh, a gaming audience that might uh, be having their first encounters with the ancient world. Finally, these inscriptions, of course, also contribute to the world's level of detail, um, a hallmark of the Assassin's Creed series. Uh, the implementation of the inscription of Lysen in Epidauros considerably heightens the detail of that setting and thus of the game itself. It's also a way of showing that ancient sources were used and to uh, give uh, credibility to um, the claim that uh, Assassin's Creed uh, produces historically accurate settings. Um, in a way, these inscriptions show how far video games have come as tools of reception. Whereas in 2009, academics warned scholars of antiquity to expect the expected while trying out uh, video game versions of antiquity, pointing out the stereotyped ways in which uh, video games often seem to recreate antiquity. Nowadays, about a decade later, we've become surprised and charmed by these small references to perhaps lesser known aspects of antiquity. Um, these deep cuts or Easter eggs um, therefore also serve as a way of engaging the historical fan community that is invested in these games. It's not rare um, to see pictures of these inscriptions posted on social media platforms like Reddit uh, by players who want to know more about them or want to ask for translations, for example. Lastly, let's discuss the formal characteristics uh, of the inscriptions. We'll divide this section up into two uh, subsections, uh, one on the material and one uh, on uh, the inscriptions, text and language. Um, in terms of material, uh, virtually every inscription in these games is written on virtual stone. As far as I'm aware, there's no inscriptions on clay, wood, or gold, for example. Um, the stones are usually uh, steles, um, some of which seem to function as uh, grave steles or tombstones. Um, plaques are also possible, uh, as we've seen with the Cyrene examples. Um, but inscriptions carved into buildings are very rare. Um, there's a temple of Zeus in Olympia, which has uh, the ten sports on it. There's the Cyrene Graffito or the bathhouse uh, in uh, Alexandria. But these are rather exceptional. 
Um, usually you'll find the inscription on a separate piece of stone rather than on the side of a building. Um, the same inscription can show up on different kinds of stones for, uh, and also with different kinds of text ordering. These stones, for example, for example, are all uh, variations on the basic license inscription found in Odyssey. Um, these three also uh, all, all, all uh, retain a somewhat rectangular shape, although the first one adds pillars uh, to each side and a temple pediment on top. Um, the two right ones are unadorned. Um, all of these, however, change the way uh, the text is ordered on the stone. In the left one, the first two lines with uh, Lyons' name and his place of origin are separated from the rest uh, of the text. In the middle one, the first five and a half lines stand separate from the remaining four and a half. And in the right one, the first three, only the first uh, three lines are complete, and all of the rest, uh, all, all of the other lines um, are in included either only fragmentarily or not at all. Uh, and this last one perhaps references the common phenomenon in epigraphy where um, text has been lost or has become unreadable because of various reasons, although this virtual stone seems to be in rather good shape. There's also two, sm uh, two taller uh, variants of the inscription, each beautifully adorned and also changing the ordering of the text, both uh, dividing the text in the middle um, into two separate fragments. Uh, another variant is this one, found near the cemetery road in Athens. Um, the stone has a statue of a dog on top of it, which nicely complements the dog that is referenced in the text itself, the dog that miraculously healed uh, Lysen. Um, such funerary statues of dogs are known from ancient sources. Um, whether this was a deliberate choice or a happy accident is difficult to assess, but uh, it does maybe seem like too big of a coincidence uh, to have the dog on top of an inscription which explicitly mentions one. Um, so we see even while the developers reuse and decontextualize the same inscriptions throughout the game app, they do make sure to include a variety uh, so that the entire map isn't dotted with the exact same stone. Moving over to text, um, there are two main ways in which uh, Ubisoft displays the text of inscriptions. One way is to copy the text in the exact way as it is presented on the stone. Valhalla, for instance, does a beautiful job of this, of copying the exact look of the inscription as it exists in real life. Take this funerary inscription uh, for uh, Claudia Martina again, for example, we see that the text uh, and its ordering is copied. And some of the cracks and breaks um, in the original have also made it into the game cracks and breaks that in reality might not even have been there at the time of Viking England. Um, sometimes the text is copied while the shape of the stone is changed, as is the case with uh, the tombstone of Aulus Alfidius Olusa, um, what in reality is a stone of over uh, two meters high, um, becomes a rather small stone in the game. The second way uh, the developers implement ancient text is by retyping the text of the inscriptions in Ubisoft's own uh, Greek font. Um, the Lyceum inscription is a good example of this, and the variations that we've uh, shown um, uh, show that they didn't or weren't able to copy the text in the same way that they did with the uh, Valhalla inscriptions. And as they're retyping the Greek letters, we find that the inscriptions start to look a lot like modern text. Uh, for instance, while we are accustomed to separating our words with spaces uh, when we type, in ancient times, people wrote their text without spaces. Each word uh, directly followed the previous one without a formal indication that uh, one word stopped and another one began. This is called uh, scriptio continua, or a continuous script, and it's something that, well, we would think that this makes the texts uh, quite hard to read, uh, the ancients apparently didn't have as much of a problem with. Um, but since we are used to do that, uh, the developers in, uh, at Ubisoft probably subconsciously uh, used spaces in text where you wouldn't find these uh, in antiquity. We can definitely see the influence of uh, modern word processors uh, in how these inscriptions are given form. Sometimes the developers also make mistakes. Um, some of these uh, are grammatical or linguistic. We've already given the example of the Cyrene Graffito. Um, the bathhouse inscription is a similar case. If we read and try to translate the text, uh, we run into some difficulties. And I've also uh, included the transliter transliteration into the Latin alphabet, uh, which will be easier to follow for anyone in the audience who doesn't know Greek. Um, at the top of the inscription, uh, it, the text just says uh, talutra, which simply means the bots. Um, the first line is relatively easy. To hudor katarisei etus podasu kai dulos xerpoiesei autus. Translated into, uh, may the water cleanse your feet and may a slave dry them. Um, the so-called optative forms, the verb translated with may, are a bit strange, 
we could have perhaps expected an imperative or a causal causal verb have the water cleanse your feet for example um, the second line is a bit weirder. Um, the first four words uh, form a sentence. Lantion club seyetain klinen. The first word, lantion, is a towel. And the last um, two words, then klinen, uh, is a sort of bed or couch um, or something that one lies on. Um, the problem lies with the second word, however. Uh, if we assume the verb club to be the same form as the verbs on the previous line, which is a plausible assumption, um, then it would most likely come from a, from a verb uh, that doesn't exist. Uh, it would be a verb like klupto, but I've tried multiple dictionaries and databases, but nothing's come up. What I think happened here is that the text of this inscription, uh, the author of this inscription wanted to use another word, the verb kalupto, uh, which is um, a Greek verb and means to cover. The author could then just have made a typo and forgotten the Greek letter A or alpha, which is a simple mistake to make. Um, the four words would then mean something along the lines of may a towel cover your seat, um, meaning that the visitors of the bathhouse are supposed to put towels down on anything they want to sit on, um, just like hotels today ask visitors to ask uh, to put down a towel whenever you go to the pool. Um, the text gets even stranger. Um, the first word, which I think they want to use as an imperative, although they've constructed it as the wrong past tense indicative, um, would mean something like take care of, although it's a strange sort of word, a choice of word in this context. Um, and tahemetera means our. The last word, however, um, hebitubia, does, as far as I know, not exist. Um, it's not in any dictionary, as far as I can tell. In fact, Literally, the only thing that comes up on Google if you look for this word is a Reddit page saying that this word doesn't exist. Um, so we can't translate that, and the sentence becomes something like, take care of our blank. Um, the two last lines are relatively straightforward. Um, translated. Set aside or literally postpone your laborious conflicts if you can go, uh, if you can, I'm sorry, uh, or go and take them home with you, meaning that the bathhouse is no place for violence. It does make a couple of grammatical mistakes, as the word do not uh, should be do not, uh, for example, and soon you mean at the end with you is a different kind of with than the with that is meant here. Just like Peter Gainsford with the graffito, I therefore suspect that some kind of translator has been used, uh, or at least it's mistakes have been made. Um, if anybody has any suggestions as to what Ebitubia could be, um, please let me know in the chat because I've been trying to figure that out for days and I haven't been able to find anything. Um, but the inscriptions uh, also have some typographical mistakes. For instance, in the license inscription, the first letter of the penultimate line um, is a Greek E or Epsilon, where it should be uh, a, a Greek S or Sigma. This is a minor typo, but there's also other instances where we find this on a larger scale, such as the Homeric hymn in Immortals, for example. Um, I've transcribed the text here as it is included in the game, as well as a, a capitalized version of the Homer original Homeric text, as it should be um, uh, on this stone, so it becomes easier to compare. Um, one small mistake is the omission of the letter N at the very end of uh, line 9. It should say Nisomenon instead of Nisomenno. Um, probably they weren't able to fit this letter on the line anymore and they just got rid of it. Um, but we also see that the inscription is mistaken in the adoption of certain letters. Um, for instance, the first word, which um, says padat, should be palad. The Greek letter uh, lambda uh, has been substituted by uh, a Greek letter delta or d. Um, through possible confusion. And this substitution happens throughout the entire text. Whenever a, a, an L or lambda is needed, uh, the text includes a delta. Perhaps the reason for this is that because the letters look relatively alike, um, they reuse the same letter texture because it will be faster to write the text that way. Um, the same thing also happens with the letters uh, O or Omicron and TH or uh, Theta. Um, again, two rather similarly looking letters. Um, line two, for instance, um, should have two O's, but it has uh, two thetas. Um, same goes for this word, um, polemeia, which should have an O instead of a TH. Um, but however, at line five, um, we do spot 
the Greek letter O next to the uh, letter TH mean that our previous assumption about the lambda and delta and the recycling of the same texture to reduce time might not be completely accurate. Uh, we also see that beyond this point in the text, uh, the letter O is used consistently whenever it is needed. Um, so why did they make this mistake at the beginning? Well, I think that they probably started out using the TH because they already needed it for the second word, Atenayen. Um, and then they kept on using it until they reached the word Pertomenai um, on line 5, which uses both TH and the O. And not wanting to have to use the same texture twice next to each other, they started to use the O, and since they've included it in the text now anyway, they kept on using it in the uh, following lines. Um, so it's interesting to see that the typographical mistakes that Ubisoft makes, uh, omissions, typos, uh, confusion of similarly looking letters, are some of the same mistakes that were actually already made in antiquity. However, and there might also be an alternative explanation for this, and this is where things potentially get really interesting. Um, the confusion between lambda and delta, for instance, uh, is an attested and established mistake sometimes made in Greek text in antiquity. Um, could Ubisoft's mistake, therefore, perhaps be a conscious mistake, uh, a reference to mistakes that were made in antiquity as a way of also adapting those practices into the game? I noticed my be reading a little bit too much into it and i personally doubt that they would go that far but it is a possibility that we should consider and i'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on it uh, in the chat um and that brings us to our conclusion or closing remarks um so we've surveyed the various inscriptions that you can find uh, in four recent ubisoft games we discussed their context their purpose we called uh, we, we talked about their formal characteristics Despite the fact that much of what I said could be considered as pointing out every, everything Ubisoft did wrong, um, the mere fact that these inscriptions are included should, I think, be appraised. Um, sure, they might copy-paste their inscriptions throughout the entire map. Some of them might not make sense in the context in which they're included. Um, they've made grammatical and typographical mistakes, but at the same time, the presence of these texts shows uh, the historical research that goes into these games and is absent in many other games. It also shows their intention to produce a relatively deep um, re reconstruction of antiquity. Um, also, we can definitely see um, an evolution in how Ubisoft uh, handles these inscriptions. The earliest ones, the ones from Origins, are some of the worst ones. Uh, there's a Eulicinian decree which has no place in Ptolemaic Egypt. There's uh, the weird graffito and the um, abomination that uses Greek and Latin letters. Um, and Odyssey is already a step up. Um, it makes fewer mistakes and even places one inscription in its actual historical context. Um, Valhalla act, uh, very accurately uh, recreates the text of the inscription and Immortals contains one inscription which they only use once in a very specific con uh, context, a context associated with the content of the inscription. Um, so who knows what future games could do with them. Um, perhaps we could have games that accurately uh, recreate the Gorton code or contain quests that actively revolve around a certain inscription. Right now, we don't know that much yet of where Ubisoft is going with the Assassin's Creed or Immortal uh, franchises. Um, but if this evolution is any indication, uh, perhaps the coming games can be even more uh, interesting as far as inscriptions are concerned. Uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> you really do. <laughs> so we do I, have I, we do have yeah. a couple quick questions, and uh, I'm going to do them a little out of order just because. Um, mm -hmm. Christiana wanted to know: uh, Is your background in classics, and what inspired you to investigate the classical inscriptions in these games? So I m my first. Uh, master's and degree that I did was a uh, Latin and Greek linguistics and literature. Uh, and then I afterwards I did um, uh, film studies and now I'm kind of combining those two and I uh, my, for my PhD I'm studying um, classically inspired video games. Um, so I'm working with these games all the time uh, and I when, when I was playing these games, I was uh, going through them and looking at them, and I found these inscriptions, and I was thinking, okay, this is 
interesting. I mean, they have these historical inscriptions in there. But then when I was walking around, I saw them popping up everywhere. And I was like, okay, maybe it, it, there's something to be explored here. And then I saw that the same thing happening in other games. And that's kind of why I uh, wanted to do that. And I think it was a very, uh, I mean, it, it's very interesting to look at uh the the, the the small details, the deep cuts, the Easter eggs of these games. Um, something I really enjoy doing. Uh, okay, so now we'll jump to the first. Uh, what was the first mistake or error that you noticed when you were playing through the game? Like, <laughs> when you were playing, did it stop you in your tracks? Were you like, do, 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 do? Okay, wait, no, I can't let that slide. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, well, that's a difficult question because it's been. When I first played them, it's been, it's, that's already like three or four years ago. Um, <laughs> seeing that uh, Origins was the first game to be released, maybe it, it could have been the, the one with the Greek and Latin letters. Uh, maybe that one, because that, really, um, that really shows <laughs> that they're mistakes. <laughs> uh, and that's something whenever I, I, I mean... You have this 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 beautiful game, uh, Assassin's Creed Origins. You can play it for 100 hours, and you and there's uh, still things uh, you could do. But uh, if that, then you see something like that, and you're you're wondering why did they do this? I mean, you have they have so many beautiful sites, so many great inscriptions, and then they have that one stone that, I mean, it, it, you can imagine it is harder to create that stone than actually just writing it in Latin letters. Um, so that kind of did stop me, but. When I play the other games, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, I don't remember actively being annoyed by it while, while I was playing or something like that. You're able to separate, I'm playing the game versus I'm studying the game. Yeah, but like I said, I, I really love the fact that they've included these games, uh, included these inscriptions in the game. So um, I know I've been criticizing them a lot and, and pointing out everything <laughs> they, they did wrong, but I really, I really, I mean, I'm a huge fan of these games and I, I really love all of these references that, that they, they uh, put in there. Um, so, I mean, whenever I, I, I find something, I, I, I stop playing whatever it is and I, I Look, uh, go online and I look up what, what, what kind of text is this and then I'm always surprised as, as to what I find and I, I was uh, it was nice to sort of reverse engineer that, that process how they um, included those texts in the game um, that kind of feeds into the last question that we pulled out of chat for you um, do you feel they care less about accuracy in this in the inscriptions or do you think that they just assume people won't notice? Mm, I think the second one. Um, I think, I mean, obviously they're, they're concerned with ac accuracy, um, but, uh, and, and, and with producing beautifully uh, detailed worlds and all that. But at the same time, they got to keep it manageable. Like I said, they, they can't include hundreds of inscriptions in their version of Greece, for example. That is um almost impossible to do that would take years uh to, to do um so i think at some point they just go this is good enough um or and people won't, won't notice uh, these mistakes um but of course people from historical game studies community or archeo gaming will notice will, will always look at these <laughs> things when they see them and they will start to uh notice those mistakes so but I think, I mean, there, there's definitely their intention um, to, to be accurate and or authentic. Um, and, and, but then they have to keep that intention as something they can work towards. I got, I got a new one for you. Um, would you say these games are generally doing a better or worse job than other forms of modern media? Since you said you've got that background. That's, yeah, that's a... Difficult question. I think because there's so much out there and there's so many games, I, you kind of have to separate Assassin's Creed from the other kinds of games. I think if you want to have an, a sort of like a complete experience of antiquity, and I think Assassin's Creed is one of the best things to, 
uh, to, to go with, I think. Um, you can watch movies and documentaries as well, but they won't be as engaging as a video game. In a video game, you, you're actively uh, participating in what is happening. You're, you're looking around um, in the world, seeing whatever you can find. Um, that being said, there's many video games that don't do that. I mean, many older games um, uh, are very... Uh, stereotypical in, in, in what they uh, include. Mm -hmm. um, but I think Assassin's Creed is definitely one of the best ways uh, to engage like a, a, an audience with uh, antiquity, especially an audience that doesn't uh, or isn't that familiar with antiquity uh, beforehand. So this is my own personal question. Uh, and just because it kind of ties in with our con and you've kind of touched on it, do you feel that... As uh, archaeology goes forward and, and the study of antiquities goes forward, do you feel that video games like this that are trying to get the details correct, do you feel like these are going to be valuable teaching tools going forward? Or do you feel like they're always just going to be relegated to being just fun? Or could they be both? No, I, I think they're definitely going to be integrated into um uh school curricula more and more i think um before i started my phd i'm, I'm still in my first year but before i started my phd my last teach uh, my, my last job was a teacher job uh teaching history and and, and latin uh in in the secondary school and in that school they had uh game consoles uh to oh. uh for the kids and they had odyssey for example um Neat. i also I, I i when i was teaching uh, the uh, Greek history uh, to those kids. I I I made a point of using as many video clips as I could from uh, Odyssey because they, um, it, it's a way of of really poking their interest and uh, and and they like it. Uh, they they think it's fun to um, see something that they uh, actively uh, recognize or that they've try it out in their own spare time for example then and they they talk about it oh did you do this oh i did that and then they uh they, they like to talk about it and it's a it's a fun way of, of engaging with them and i think um games are like i already kind of said i think i think games are really evolving and and i they're, they're becoming more and more accurate or they, they have more and more um references uh to ancient sources um and I think that we would be remiss if we didn't use that uh, in, in in our teaching. I want to make sure we don't have any more questions before I let you escape. This has been a, a fabulous talk. I am I, I like when people go through and look at the little tiny details that the game doesn't expect you to notice. So the the whole translation thing is just I love it. <laughs> And I love that you're like Thank this you. abomination in scripture because it's all the letters are all over the place. Yeah, I love I mean, that. Um, that's one thing that I, I will never understand why people do that. Like they use Greek letters for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah, I really think that's so strange. The Nike thing but, actually made me laugh out loud. I was like, hey, yeah, well, just do it. <laughs> like, when those picture, when that picture was posted, I think I saw an explosion of, of tweets on, on Classics Twitter or uh, people saying, this is so weird. Why did they, I mean, they, 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 they are inspired by, I mean, their name is a Greek goddess. They should, they, they should right. know. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Hi, right, real quick, I'm going to chime in. Uh, the database you have up on the screen right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to tell us what that is real quick? Yeah, so uh, as part of my PhD project, I, I am creating a uh, database of uh, video games uh, set in classical antiquity, like a, a Greece, Rome, or uh, mythological story world. It's still a work in progress, uh, but I think currently there's 259 games in there, uh, all video games from 1977 until now. Wow. Um, it's uh, something I try to update. I haven't been able to update it for some time but i plan to do another update in august or september um but yeah so i try to give a chronological list of the games and then with each game there's um additional information on its uh, release uh the setting some uh, characters that are notable uh, i also try to give uh, academic bibliography but it's all still a work in progress but i think it's still uh, it's, it's already uh, a useful tool uh 
to be out there. And the fact that I, in in August or in September, I'm I'm gonna publish a couple of blog posts that people have sent in uh, on video games and antiquity. So I'm really excited about that. I am too. I I love that. Yeah. That's like my big driver. We need to do more of that. So again, yeah, thank yeah, you. About that too. Yeah, thank you very much for coming on. Yeah. I am so glad you decided to share this with us at the con, and I hope to see you back maybe next year with uh, even more information. Who knows? Yeah, maybe. Thank you very much. This was very fun to do.